Anthony. Uh, thanks guys for having me back here uh, today to talk about the historic soul parish. Um, which is where I grew up. Um, I either lived or worked here for 50 years. Um, so I can you know the area well. To me it's, it's I presume you know where the South Parish is by the way, it's, it's kind of centred around the South Chapel, uh, St. Lambert South. But the parish boundary, as well, such as it is today, would be, let's say, on the northern side. It's the south side of Oliver Plunkett Street, the GPO side, would be the northern boundary. Um, on the eastern side, you're talking about the Jewtown area, Albert Road, Albert Street, that area. And on the south side, you're up around um, High Street, Women Road, up onto St. Patrick's Road, through Deer Park, and then coming around by Greenmount, Greenmount School itself is actually within the South Parish. Um, and then down Green Street, around by St. Mary's Cathedral, um, taking in St. Mary's Cathedral. So that's the kind of the location that we're, we'll be speaking about. And we'll be only dipping into it, we'll be only scratching the surface of the history because it's. To me, it's like an open air museum. There's hardly a street or a, a, a corner turn where, where something of historical significance is either there or took place or some person lived there um, at some stage, you know, such as a very historic area. And I hope you get a kind of a general feel for it uh, during this talk. The talk takes about two and a half hours or so, bed down, so I'm only joking. <laughs> That'd be over here picking up. Um, <laughs> so we start at the South Gate Bridge, which I suppose is, is the place really where the area where Cork itself began. If you if you kind of go with the, the, the Viking setting there, or prior to that the monastic settlement found by Saint Finbar, it was all in that general area. So either side of the South Gate Bridge would have been the kind of Viking settlement, and I put down there South Gate Bridges because it's a unique bridge. It's actually two different bridges, and the photographs are kind of a giveaway there. But that's both sides of the same bridge, but they're completely different as you can see in terms of their makeup. Um, the top photograph there is the the side facing off French's Key. That's the original bridge. That was built in uh, 1713, so it's just over 200 years old, um, sorry, 300 years old at this stage. The lower photograph there shows the, the view looking down Sullivan's Quay, and that bridge is yet to reach its 200th anniversary. It was built in 1824. So why am I saying that when it's one bridge? Uh, the original bridge was the entrance to the, the South Gate entrance to the city, the old medieval city of Cork. And we see in the next slide there was, there was a prison, the old South Gate prison stood at the entrance so people had to pass through a big archway to go into the South Gate Street, into the city. When that prison was removed towards the end of the 18th century, the bridge was widened basically in the early 19th century. So around 1824, they added on, or they widened it by about half again. So it's it's it was doubled in length, or doubled in width, I should say. If you look at the lower photograph there, underneath the centre arch, there's a clear line going through the centre of it. Can you just make it out? I might get too close to that speaker, and my, my red point wasn't working. So that's the divide between the old bridge upriver and the new bridge. River. So it's, it's double the width that it would have originally been. And there's over a hundred years of the difference between the two different bridges. Um, also, and the Sullivan Ski Side is much shorter. So it's much shorter than the French Ski Side. That's because the key was only built up in the 1820s. So the bridge one was as long on that side then as it is on the French Ski Side. So it's a, it's a unique bridge, as I say, amongst all of the bridges in, in Cork because it has two construction dates over a hundred years um, apparent. And if you think of it, if you walk up to the next bridge, which is the next bridge up from 
so, uh, from Saltgate Bridge. It's Proby's Bridge. And Proby's Bridge, again, it's, it's a unique bridge because Proby's Bridge is only half a bridge. So you have two bridges in one year, and then Proby's Bridge is only half a bridge there. Because the other side is, is road surface snow. It used to be a proper bridge, but an actual either side. But the, the western side is, is, is the road, basically. So if you look at it, it looks like you're looking at a bridge. But if you're standing on the other side, you're standing at the road. So again, you have these two unique bridges. Pretty much, and there's, there's the divide I was talking about. And as I say, you can see the different makeup in the rubble stone making up this French ski side and all cut line stone here. And the southern ski side. And that's the, the, the old prison that I mentioned, the old Southgate prison. The county jail <coughs> it was known as well because it was built originally to hold prisoners from the county who committed crimes outside of the city boundary. The city was a much smaller place uh, than it is today. Of course, we had the big expansion in, in recent months, but even before I expanded, that old city would have been much smaller. Uh, there's a lot of old boundary stones, stuff of the road that you might see from time to time, which kind of gives you the confines of the city as it was back then. And that's a sketch. Um, I suppose it's, in, yeah, it's an 18th century sketch showing the, the prison that stood there from 1730 right up until the end of the 18th century. Um, the houses here are the backs of houses that were located on Globe Lane. Now, Globe Lane is called French's Key today. So if you came over the South Cape Bridge and then turned right, you were turning out the Globe Lane. So you've got the front of the houses on the other side. Then you went through an archway and you came over out the French's Key. So French's Key was one half of it, Globe Lane was the other half of it. So there was about seven or eight houses uh, located along Globe Lane on the quay side and the bats were kind of jutting out over the river so they were held up on these metal struts or timber struts as the bats of the houses, the, the, uh, not so much balconies but the bats of the houses themselves were overhanging the river and you can still see some of the corbel stones that held the struts in the quay wall today they are still sticking out as well seven or eight of them here sticking out uh, dating back to that uh, that time when, when the old lane still had the houses there but the prison itself was replaced by the western road county jail in the 1790s uh, so that's why that was closed and if you look up on top you can see the, the spiked heads uh, of executed convicts so that was a warning to people who were entering the, the old medieval city or the old <coughs> later 18th, 17th and 18th century city. Not to step out of line basically because this could happen to you. Um, it wasn't a pretty sight I suppose for people walking down the bridge and they're looking up these guys gazing down at them. Um, the heads were only spiked really on, on the South Cape Bridge side because the main execution place would have been up on Gallows Green in the Greenmount area, it's, it's that little triangular piece of land more or less facing Greenmount School. If you know it, it was Gould Street, one side, Green Street, Gould Street, and uh, there's a St. Finbar's Terrace, I think it's the row of houses. Uh, so that's where the main gallows was, which is why they used to spike the heads on the South Gate uh, jail, not on the North Gate at that stage. But it's, that was removed. A totally different type of prison to the ones that we'd recognise in that there were no kind of single cells within the prison as such. There were large rooms where there might be 10, 15, 20 people all thrown in together. Uh, no such thing as bedding, only some straw on the ground. You could imagine what sanitation was like. Food, depending on what you could afford to kind of get people to bring in here yeah, because what you were serving in there wasn't worth eating, so it was not a pleasant. Uh, to be. They're probably out there. Yeah, a little uh, couple of people there to see them. Uh, the kids looking on. And there's still one of those windows that you can see now, which is bricked up uh, today. You can see it 
in the key wall. There are some remnants of, of the prison that still survived to this day. One of them is here, um, and this is a photograph from 1966, showing one of the receptionists at the old beams from Crawford. Rory, she's holding a fairly large key in her hand, and kind of mock, yeah, oiling it up to place into that fairly large lock. And that lock is at the, the entrance of the company house of Beams and Crawfords, or what was Beams and Crawfords Rory. And that's believed to have come from the old Southgate prison. And it's one of the locks and keys that they used in the prison, and it was recycled, let's say, uh, after the prison was taken down. And a fairly large section of the prison still exists underground. Um, the top photograph right there was taken in 2005 during a, a big archaeological dig in the city car park. Some of you may remember it, it was going on for a long time. Um, and in the corner, right up the corner there, the bridge, the Southgate Bridge is just on the other side of the fencing here. So right up in the corner is this fairly big chunk of the Southgate prison. And it's only inches under the road surface, the present day road surface, as you can see. If you're in the city car park, that corner slopes up. And the reason it does is because you have the prison underneath it. Or certain rooms of the prison, or cells of the prison underneath it. And that's still there today, it's just covered over afterwards. This incidentally, this section of wall is part of the old medieval city wall uh, that circled the old city from the 12th century right up to the kind of 18th century when they began to, uh, to demolish it and take it away. And I mentioned the Beams and Crawford's counting house. You know, there was double steps up to that, if you remember. And sitting atop the steps was this limestone block. I presume it's still there because, of, you know, you can't see the, the counting house there with all the, the big containers up in front of it, with all the building work. Um, but again, that's believed to have come from the old Southgate prison. It's, a, it's a, a particular kind of relic of the Southgate prison. Do you remember those heads on spikes you saw a minute ago? That's supposed to be one of the blocks that held the spikes into which the, the heads were set, you know? So again, it's a kind of a gruesome reminder of Kirk's uh, ancient history. And I, I was just having a whole thing still there. Passing up along French's Quay, then you, you meet Forbes, Kilmerbo, uh, and then up the side of Forbes is this little narrow thoroughfare, which has three pronunciations. Its proper pronunciation is Kieser's Hill, so many people here would call it Kieser's Hill, as in the cold K, cold key, Kieser's Hill, or Kaiser's Hill, which is what my mother used to call it, my mother who grew up on Crosses Green. And she only often referred to it as Kaiser's Hill. Uh, so there's three different pronunciations. But Kaiser's Hill, the name itself kind of recalls the time the Vikings uh, and that settlement that uh, grew up around that area. There were similarly named hills and streets mm -hmm. and lanes in the likes of Wexford and, and Waterford had their own Kaiser's Lane and Kaiser's Hill. Um, meaning that the, the pathway leading to the quayside or the pathway leading to the wharf. That's the kind of the Scandinavian origin of the name Kiesel. So that kind of tells us that that thoroughfare has been in existence possibly since the 9th, 10th centuries when the time the Vikings came in and would have grown up as a simple trackway uh, for trading as was going on between the the new settlers on the Matry Road and the Irish settlement in the higher road around the Barrack Street area. So it was a simple track we originally presume, and then buildings went up either side of it and it became a more formalised lane we are hill as it is today. Uh, and the steps within it brings you up to the entrance from French's Quay to the entrance uh, of Elizabeth Fort. But very few people I reckon would use it today. The only time it's used in any great numbers is when people are using the funeral home. And you come out the side door there at the Kaiser Hill. Uh, other than that, you, you kind of walk past in the, in the blink of an eye, but there's what there's like a thousand years of history. And that you narrow thoroughfare is one of the <coughs> oldest thoroughfares that we have um, in the city today, outside Barrett Street. 
it would be probably amongst the two oldest um, remaining from the time of the, the Viking settlement. And again, just further on, and of course, we have St. Finbar's Cathedral, and, and this, of course, isn't the present day cathedral, this is the 18th century cathedral. Uh, that was demolished in 1865. These are two views of it, one taken from the front, uh, taken from the Bishop's Palace side, and then this is a rear view. Uh, now what we're looking at here actually is, is a tower and spire. The tower was, was built in 1677 or thereabouts, uh, and then the spire was added in about 1719. And then this bit, was added in 1738. So it's like a jigsaw puzzle again being put together at different times. Um, so that's, a, that's an 18th century cathedral that was added to an earlier tower and spire, basically, that formed part of an earlier church or cathedral um, on the same site. So when they rebuilt it, they just simply <coughs> reused the old tower and spire in the, in the 1730s. Now it's a pretty small building, as you can see, for a cathedral, it's the Protestant of Church of Ireland, Cathedral of Cork, of course. And for years they, they were saying, look, it's kind of a shabby excuse for a cathedral in Cork. So they wanted to rebuild it. Um, and so in the 1860s they had a, a competition to find an architect to design the new cathedral. Uh, and that man, of course, was William Borges, the man who won the architectural competition. Uh, and he gave us the cathedral that we have today. But in January of 1865, the old cathedral had been demolished and the foundation stone was laid for the new one. And this was taken on January 12th, I think, of 1865. It's a wonderful Victorian image. Um, you can see everybody is looking tensely at the camera because if you moved at all, you became a blur such as kind of this man here, or this man in the car, any bit of movement at all, the camera would, would lose your features, so they were kind of try to stay as still as possible. Uh, you can just go, this is the bishop, actually, Bishop Gray, and he's like a guy standing to attention, as you can see, making sure he's saying to himself, don't move, don't move, he said. Uh, but it's a wonderful Victorian image. That can be seen, actually, on the, the city library website, you know, past and present. It's a website that's well worth looking at. It's probably one of the best library websites in the country, uh, I reckon. But the photographer is looking kind of side on to the crowd here, and then he moves slightly and he pans around to the front of them, so he's looking face on, so these are both taken on the same day. Uh, and there is the, the, don't ask me what the, the, the name of that contraption is apparatus, but there's the foundation stone being laid for the present day cathedral. This um, is a Mason Square, I think it's called. Maybe not a term, but, but that was used, uh, or a level to, to mark the level of the foundation stone, to make sure everything was even when it was going in. It was used a few years previously um, to lay the foundation stone of St. Patrick's Bridge in 1859. And you can actually see it today inside the Freemasons Hall on Tuckey Street. It's on display in there, so that very uh, level or, or Mason Square. Right? Again, what the technical term for the door was, that you can see here in the photograph in 1865. You can still see in 2019 if you went to the Mason Hall on Tuckey Street. So these are beautiful images, I think, with the top hats and everything, big chimney pot hats. These are the Freemasons themselves. You can see some of them have their Masonic bibs. Yeah, there's a lot of Masons prepared in the actual ceremony itself. And this is the building, uh, present day cathedral, as it looked when it actually opened in 1870. It opened in November of 1870. You can see it has no spirals yet at that stage. None of the three spirals were, were built. Um, it also doesn't have any of its uh, carvings or statue work. Uh, and the cathedral has over 1,200 pieces of, of carving or statues, both inside and outside the cathedral. Uh, that went on for years. I mean, the work went on for, for many, many years. 
uh, out of York, he got to Petersburg in uh, 1870. Um, when William Borges won the competition originally, uh, or the competition itself, I suppose, one of the main stipulations uh, of it was that the cathedral should not cost more than 15,000 pounds to build. So in the 1860s, that was a hell of a lot of money, 15,000 pounds. Borges said, that, and many of the other architects indeed also said that you can't have a proper cathedral for that price. So it was kind of built in stages, so this is the way it, it, it opened in 1870. Um, and about nine years later then, the spires had been added, and we're left with this beautiful uh, structure. It's one of the gems of, of Cork, really, in a historic sense. Um, but not only did the, this cathedral get higher and higher, but of course the price and the cost went higher and higher. And by the time William Burgess actually died, which was in 1881, Remember that the foundation started in 1865, by 1881, it still wasn't even completed. A lot of the carvings weren't completed by then. So there was work still going on. And at that stage, they had spent £100,000 on it. So from 15000 to £100,000, about seven times the original cost, let's say. So this is kind of the children's hospital level, if you can imagine that. It's not a new phenomenon by any means, these overruns in, in pricing, but for buildings here in, in Ireland, or anywhere else, I presume. But it, it was well worth uh, the money that they put into it. Um, I presume some of you have been in there, or a lot of you would have been in there. It's well worth the visit just to go in and see it. I know there's a, there's a cost of it, could be five euro, I think. Or it could be more uh, to get in, but it's well worth going in and, and wandering around, or even taking a tour. Uh, inside, inside and outside, of course, the most famous piece of sculpture on the, the cathedral is called the Angel, as we call it, or the Angel of the Resurrection. And that was actually a, a gift from William Borges, the architect, on the opening of the cathedral in 1870. Uh, it is in gold, of course. Uh, as some fellow found out there about 10 years ago, I remember we went up the scaffolding and he broke off the two horns, thinking that they were gold. And he, be away with a few bob, which they're only kind of, I think, only timber, hollow centre, and then kind of go a leaf or something wrong with you know. So, uh, thankfully, the horns were found up in, what was it? Oh, that's the church up there by the uh, Gladwell Road. Trinity Church, is it? No, the, the Presbyterian Church at the bottom there, so the, they were found in the grounds there, I think. Uh, not on the airport, and put back on again. So that was the Golden Angel from 1870. To the right of it there is, is a, actually a cannonball that's hanging off a, a chain in the cathedral. And that cannonball was discovered when they were demolishing the old cathedral. They found a cannonball embedded in the masonry. Um, and it was believed to be fired during the siege of Park of 1690. Remained there for all that time up till 1865 when the demolition work was taking place. And they had a bit of force, I think, that they, look, they found it of, of enough significance that they put it on display. And it's been on display in the cathedral ever since it opened. But you can still see it today. It actually, they even wrote on it Fire from Elizabeth Fort 1690, so 1690, just in case people didn't know what it was. And, and then there's a big stone column in the bottom image here, just to the right of the actual altar itself. It's known as the Heroes Column. It's a memorial column for the, the dead of the Great War. And of course we had all the commemorations there in the last uh, weekend, uh, commemorating Armistice Day. But there would have been a lot of them held in, in the cathedral around this uh, column in St. Fimbert's. Because, as I said, it, it, it remembers the death of the Great War of St. Fumbert's Cathedral mm -hmm. Parish. Uh, and that timber box that you can see there, if you open it, you can see a big uh, memorial book mm -hmm. with all the names of, of the, the men who died during the Great War in, from St. Fumbert's Parish. And the two crosses I have signed with them, they were um, field crosses that marked the graves of two of the fallen soldiers in France. Um, brought back then to Cork 
and were placed here in the St. Mary's Cathedral. They are fairly rough crosses, I mean, typical of the, the early crosses in the battlefields when, when guys were just being buried uh, fairly quickly after they were killed, uh, before the, the proper headstones and, and battlefield cemeteries went in. Uh, so these mark, they have the names and the regiments of the two soldiers. One of them is actually one of the, um, quite close to here, one of the Sarsfield family of Duclyde House, which is it down here? The old Duclyde House, well, just below us on Sarsfield Road, I think. Sarsfield Road, of course, the name itself is taken from the family. So they were a well known family here, and one of those crosses <coughs> is to one of the, the Sarsfield members of the family who fought and died uh, in France during the Great War. Yeah, it was something that was used for at, at different periods for different things. Wasn't it used for children from Northern Ireland at one time, I think, coming down in the 70s, I think it is. This is a wonderful um, and very recently commissioned drawing or painting of Elizabeth Fort during its construction in the 1620s. Uh, and it was, as I said, it was only recently painted and it's on display in Elizabeth Fort itself. If you go in there, the artist was, man you can see there was a name in the corner, uh, Philip Armstrong. And it's, it's a beautiful piece of work. It's, it's, it's very accurate, somewhat probably conjectural in some parts, but he based it all around on the map evidence, that early 17th century map evidence. So a lot of the details are, are uh, correct. In that sense, in, in that you have the old Timber Southgate Bridge with the two towers on either side of it. There's the kind of southwestern corner of the old medieval city, um, St. Lawrence's Church here. This would be all kind of site of Beams and Crawford's, but the old Beams and Crawford Brewery today. Um, and then you're going up around Barrack Street direction, heading out to Bandon Road, and then this turns off to what's now Green Street. Uh, would have been the road to Kinsale at that time, so that was the Kinsale Road that you came in. And then you're looking at the old St. Mary's Cathedral, Bishop's House, St. Mary's of the Isle. You know, so there's some fabulous um, details in, the, in this drawing. It's well worth spending time just to have a look at it and take it in. But you can see that the fort itself has been built. And this would have been the second fort to have stood on that site. It was a, the original fort was opened in uh, around 1601, named after Queen Elizabeth I, who was on the throne at that time, and she died just shortly after it. The fort was attacked uh, by the Irish, partially destroyed, but then had to be rebuilt by them. Uh, and then in the 1620s, they decided to build a brand new, kind of more substantial fort. First fort might have been the lot of Erkton works, so we're not exactly sure how it looked. Um, the second fort, this one was far more substantial. And in the centre of it, you can see that they're taking down the old um, Holy Room Church that stood in the centre of Elizabeth Fort. I think they did um, recently they did some geophysics and they found traces of the, the foundations in the centre of the air of the present day as this fort of that uh, church. So it was still the foundations of our part and our salon around uh, there. So it's a, it's a beautiful image. Go up to say, or come up to the Elizabeth Fort and have a look at it yourselves. And the map on the left here, this map drawing is, is actually a contemporary map from 1626 showing the co completed fort. You see it just as the fort of Cork at the time. Um, and there's your entrance, there's these angular bastions that gives the fort, it's kind of term, the term star fort is attached to these type of forts because of the shape of them. And that's what we, these would have been where the, the, the pieces of ordnance or the cannon were located. And of course, all the cannon are facing towards the north side of the city because that's where all the troublemakers were. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was not. <laughs> leave that part. <laughs> uh, but these were, these would have been, as I said, pointing out there was other cannon pointing that way. But the fort itself was more of a defensive 
fort than uh, in many ways than an offensive fort. It was offensive in terms of it dominated the old medieval city. It was a kind of a big brother field with I suppose if you saw this big new fort up in this big old crop of limestone, you knew there were they were they were kind of looking over you, keeping an eye on you. Um, but on the southern side in the ground rises up behind it. So it, 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 it's kind of easier to attack from the southern side. It's kind of dominated by the higher ground behind it. So in that sense, it's more of a, uh, an offensive than a defensive uh, fort. Now, during the, the siege of Cork itself, the fort was held by the Jacobite forces. And it was under attack from three different locations. One was from the direction of the cathedral itself, which was more small arms fire than anything else. But then there was cannon located up there, kind of in the, the kind of Bandon Road, Green Street Junction, Upper Barrack Street. And then there was more cannon firing from kind of up around this direction, which would have been in the Cat, Catwort uh, area, which was kind of the junction of Tower Street and Fire Street. Would have been where Johnny Lane's old chicken factory would have been, if you remember that. So that was the Cat Fort was around here. So again, that dominated Elizabeth Fort in terms of the height of it. Now the fort didn't fall during the actual, actual uh, siege. It, it was given up during the terms of surrender when the city itself uh, fell. The military then stopped using it around the 1806. There, there had been actually two different forts or two different barracks on either side of Barrack Street. One was the barracks in Elizabeth Fort. But then you know Prosperity Square across the road from it? That was another barracks, another military barracks, that opened in 1898. So we had a barrack on either side. Um, but they both went out of, well, went out of use on a full time basis uh, by the military in the early 19th century when the new barracks was built on the north side, what's today Collins Barracks. And Collins Barracks was probably four or five times the size of both of these put together, so it was much, much bigger. Um, Barracks then bought it all here along Barracks Street. It then became, or Elizabeth Ford then became a, a female convict depot for a number, number of decades shortly after it closed in 1806 at the fort. It was used as a convict depot for women to send them before they were sent off to the likes of Van Diemen's Land, New South Wales, and places like that. And it was in use like that right up until the 1830s. Um, Closed, I think, in 1836, around December, September 1836. Uh, the following year, then, the constabulary, the police constabulary, took it over as their own depot and they began to train recruits from the Munster area. You know, this was the training depot for Munster recruits. Used it like, for, like that for about six years until the new Phoenix Park depot opened, which was the kind of all Ireland training centre then for recruits into, uh, into the police. Shortly after that, then it was used for a time as a, a cattle market. And then during the famine, the authorities began to use the, the, the old barrack buildings as a fever hospital um, for a, a period during the operating of the famine when, when lots of hospital beds like that were needed due to a lot of sickness around the, the starvation here in the city. The Royal Irish Assembly then took it over again and they had it right up until Irish independence in the time of the Civil War. And during that period, the Civil War period, the barracks was destroyed by the anti treaty forces uh, when they were leaving the city in, in August of 1922. Uh, anything that could have been of any use to the new Free State Army who had arrived in passage and had fought their way up to the city. The anti treaty forces left, but they destroyed any of the buildings that could be of use to them, uh, any of the police or military buildings. So, Elizabeth Fort, Barracks was destroyed, the HQ of the RIC in Union Key would have been destroyed, um, the Collins Barracks, or what's today, Collins Barracks was destroyed, the Rod burnt out, the Bridewell would have been burnt out and destroyed, um, the Tuckey Street Garth House was burnt out and destroyed, anything like that. Uh, Copy Street Gardens would be where um, the Vincent de Paul building is today, near the Grand Parade side of Copy Street. Uh, so that's, 
that was the old Tuckney Street get out that was there. So anything they left was destroyed by treaty forces, which is why, of course, when, when the Free State Army arrived in Park City, they used the Imperial Hotel as their <coughs> HQ because they basically hadn't any barracks to go to. Uh, and that was the way it was for a number of years until they got the Collins barracks up and running then again. So it took about seven years for the, the new buildings to be built within the, the old Elizabeth Fort. So, and they're the buildings that we can see today. They were occupied by the first uh, batch of new civic guard in August of 1929. Um, and of course today you now it's been used and it's been used quite well as a tourist attraction. Uh, particularly since they opened up all the ramparts and that. So there are wonderful views of the city, you can win there, it's open every day, free to go in. Uh, and just recently they opened up a couple of exhibition rooms inside the, the old Garden yeah, Barracks itself, um, which closed about, oh, must be seven or eight years ago, no, the stage is since the barracks closed. Um, which is well worth the visit, which is one of the up and coming kind of uh, heritage locations that we have here around the city. That now tied to with never made the place and place like that are gonna bring that whole area, the heritage and the history of that whole area uh, back to life again, thankfully. Not too far away from, from Elizabeth Fort, uh, if you travel along Reed Square and up onto Tower Street, you come to Cannon's Tower, which is still there today of course. Uh, well, it doesn't look like this though. Uh, I took this photograph probably must be 16, 17 years ago now, when it was the kind of focal point of the beer garden of the local pub, the Tower Inn, uh, which has since been demolished. And all around it, all the gardens around it have been filled in with apartments. And that's uh, it's not easy to view the, the tower today now. Um, only when the kind of entrance gate to the apartments is open, you can kind of stick your head in and see it. And it's been completely covered over and, and rendered uh, with yellow kind of rendering. Uh, there's only a few of the stones that are, are uh, peeping off from, from the render today. It was basically it was an observation tower that was the, the focal point of, as you can see from the advertisement there on the right hand side, the tower gardens, great attractions at the tower gardens and concert called Tower Hill. I'd never called it, or I've seen it called Tower Hill up until that. Uh, Friars Walk, Cork. And the man here that owned it was Michael Cannon, and he was the publican who had the pub on the side. And it was he who developed these gardens and built uh, the tower. Now he was advertising all kind of wonderful entertainments and activities, including croquet, archery, cricket grounds. Uh, law balls, uh, law billards, um, there was an outdoor gymnasium, a uh, short race course with a half mile run. All these things were being advertised for them, or by them. Whether they existed at all, it's, it's fairly doubtful. If you, if you care what I, uh, or listen to what I said there, know a lot of that stuff would have been for the kind of middle and upper classes, these kind of entertainers and activities would have been a more middle and upper class and a level of people would have been doing that. But this, these gardens were, in, were not in that kind of location, so it wouldn't have attracted those kind of people if they were there at all, as they say. The tower himself, we know, was there. Um, and he, he goes to great lengths to describe how you can see almost all the way to Bougon Barrow, yeah. if you were to the top of it. But, um, um, you can see some wonderful things from the top of the tower, but you cannot see Hoogan Barra. <laughs> or anywhere close to it. Um, I've been up, up almost to the top of my step, so that's why I say that. I had a good look up and couldn't see the safe from Barra's oral tree anywhere. Either, so. But it's, it's, uh, it is doubtful whether too much of that was there. Even, even the great concert hall that is advertising there was no more than a big timber stage. You know, we kind of know that, but we kind of cover over it. So. And he got into a lot of strife because of the type of people it was attracting, which were kind of the, the, the sailors and, and people coming up from the docks and stuff. 
and there was a lot of drinking and carousing and, and kind of a bit of dodgy activity going on there, you know. So and every time he came up to have his license renewed every October, there was always complaints against having the license renewed. Uh, so sometimes the police were on his side, sometimes they weren't. But he did have another pub on Abbey Street, just a short distance away, that the police called was probably the worst conducted house in Cork. <laughs> Um, be, uh, frequented by thieves, prostitutes, and fucking boys, they said. So, if that was the type of business that he was running, this wasn't going to uh, attract your croquet and all those actually client by any means. So, that's why we think that guy just was actually in existence. Um, it was open for about 10 years, and then he gave up the license. He sold his license to another man at the gap, and such as they were closed down. The tower we know is there, still there today. And there was two boxes, donation boxes, on either side of the doors you went in if you were going up to try and see Google and Barra. <laughs> and if you were Protestant, you gave your money into one box, and if you were Catholic, you gave your money into another box. They were for the Protestant sick poor societies and the Catholic sick poor societies. Now it we'll probably tells us something about Michael Callan that the Catholic Sick Poor Society wouldn't take the money in the box. They didn't want his money. So that probably tell you more about it than anything else, you know. I don't think the Protestants were too worried about the money here, so they took it. Um, but the Catholics certainly didn't want to be touching his money they said, you know. So. But it's 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 still a focal point here in the South Side or in the South Parish today. It's good that it still stands. Um, despite the kind of dodgy history around it, uh, and those advertisements appeared, were appearing in the directories at the time in the 1860s, but they had a kind of a 10 year lifespan. Despite its, its kind of ancient look, it, it was only built, as I said, in 1865, so it's more of a kind of a folly than anything else. And heading down to the, the eastern side of the South Parish, um, this interesting gabled building here is today home to the National Sculptor Factory. I'm sure you've all passes you're driving along there, Albert Street, um, heading up towards the, the South Link. And it was originally built to be the home, as you can see at the top there, the Cork Electric Tramways and Lighting Company. This was the tram depot. Uh, and if you look at the two arches here, on either side, no bricked up, but they were the entry and exit points for the trams when they came into the depot night when they left in the mornings to go up and do their runs. The trams first started running in December of 1898, and um, there were three different routes, about 10 miles track in all was laid uh, for the three routes, and the three routes were um, somewhere in north to Sunday as well. There was um, Tivoli to Black Rock and Blackpool to Douglas. There were the three routes, and each of them kind of crossed through the city centre on their way to their destinations. They only existed really, or they only ran for about just over 30 years. Uh, they closed down in 1931. So it was kind of a very sad day for people that grew very fond of them. But they were closed originally in March of 1931, due really to the pressure from buses and more people were using the bus at that station instead of the trams. But when, as soon as the trams start, stopped running in March, they found that they didn't have enough buses to cater for the number of people who wanted to use them. So they had to start off the trams just in a week later and run them again for another six months up until the end of September. Uh, 1931, that's when they finally closed. And of course, once the trams were out of the way, the bus fares went up by about 50%, between 50% and 150%. So the public weren't very happy with that because this was the time when people didn't have their own transport. If you were a bicycle, you were doing well. Um, so the, the mode of transport for getting around the city at that stage would have been the trams up when they uh, disappeared. And there's a couple of nice photographs taken 
behind the walls here, in the tram depot itself. This is one of the uh, photos right there from William Graves, great book, the tramways of uh, Cork City. And uh, it's taken behind us, as I said, the walls inside the depot itself. And you can see if some of the trams and some of the drivers or conductors there on it as well, a few of the men inside. There was about 35 trams in all operating at different times uh, across the city. This was taken by, they were still running, of course. And this is the, the same area that was taken after they closed or after they stopped running, and the trams are being uh, dismantled and taken apart. You can see the man is taking on the wheels there and off that one. Uh, no, they were, they were put to different uses afterwards. They weren't just broken up. I mean, people might remember there was a uh, Trams being used for holiday homes in various parts of the countryside. I think Coop Max Shelley might have had one or two of them. Um, and people, what they did was they, they chopped the tram in half and then they turned them around. So you'd have the front and back door would be side by side. You get me? So they kind of did the flip with them like that. So that's the way people were kind of using them a lot of the time. But it was a sad day for Carcodians when those uh, trams stop running. Not too far away from the tram depot then we had this particular building, which doesn't exist anymore. It's the original um, station or terminus for the Cork Black Rock and Passage Railway. And that was the very first railway station to be built in the city. It opened in 1850. And the, the coming of the railways to Cork or to, to any part of Ireland was, was a, a huge revolution in terms of you know, opening up the countryside for people because in the 1840s and 50s, again, the only way the vast majority of people had of getting along was, was Shanks Mayor. They walked, you, they didn't have their own horse and carts, which were too expensive. You know? And they didn't need to travel any great distances. They probably lived and worked, and many of them at that stage would have spent their whole lives probably within a 10 mile radius, I'd say, never went beyond that because they didn't have the need to. Uh, they didn't have the, the need to go travelling up the country on coaches and stuff like that. Uh, so when the railways came, it really did open up the countryside. And this, as I said, was the very first station for that company. And like it says in the, in the title there, that's where they went to, Cork, Black Rock, <coughs> a passage. Some of you might have done the walkway down the old Black Rock railway line, which is part of the route of the, the trains here. And the original section of track coming from this station went along the waterfront, along the marina side, and then turned inland, where it does today, just behind the Atlantic Pond, and carries on where the walkway is today. That original station was down at the junction of Victoria Road. Victoria Road, we were going up here. So that's down at the Victoria Key or Kennedy Key today. I think the, is it the Marine Mills or Farlong's Mills was built on the side afterwards uh, when that was demolished. Those, both those photographs were taken after the station closed. Um, so it's out of use when those particular photos uh, were, were taken. It was replaced in 1873 by this building, not too far away, but a little bit closer to the city, um, along Albert Street, or the Belmont Road, which is the street Albert Road. It's where the Carey's pool there was, and the Sexton Fair, just behind the Sexton Fair, well, the former Sexton Fair. So, but that building still stands, and that's the replacement for the Carlton Black Rock and Passage, that's their second station. The reason they replaced it was, was because the council or the town council, the city council, wanted their land back. The land that the original stretch of track was going around the marina. They wanted that for development themselves. So they struck a deal with the railway company to move that original section of track inland. So it went inland and the city council bore about 90% of the cost of building the new station for them because of that. Um, and the new route would follow our today's Monaghan Road. You know the Monaghan Road? Mm -hmm. So that, that kind of curved section, that curved road would be more or less the route of the original track after that when they moved it in. And it had to go behind 
your car race course, um, which was in the in that area, or Fords, which was your factory at Fords. So it came up then, and it went up again. The photograph here would be taken on the left in the 1920s. That would be kind of above the Atlantic Pond today. So that's where many people walk along the marina today. And the Atlantic Pond would be kind of just down off to the, to the left of the picture. The Atlantic Pond was created until the 1940s. So much later than this was only kind of swampy ground. But um, do you remember the old Perry Keeve, if you were going into the city terrace end, there was a kind of a narrow pathway down off the Marlin Road, a little dog track more or less, um, down by where the entrance to the marquee is, but a little bit to the side of it. Many of you might have walked and if you were going to the city end and the terrace, um, but that was the track bed for the old railway line, and then it went up a little bit of height and then came over onto the marina where you see the train um, there in the 1920s. By that stage, they had extended the line for about 50 odd years of their life, the first 50 years, they were only going as far as passage, which tells us something about passage being a destination back then. You know, my passage was only about six or seven miles down the road, and yet people wanted to go to passage all the time. The first weekend it opened, something like, on the Sunday, 6,000 people went down on the train to passage and back. So that's why I think about it opened up the countryside for the, the locals here in Cork. In the start of the 20th century, then they began to extend it, they extended to Mount Stone in 1902, uh, Carrigaline in 1903, and then Crosshaven in 1904. The image of the train there was taken from the photographer who was standing up on this bridge. This kind of windy staircase, you know, the spiral staircase, metal bridge that crossed over the track and allowed people access to the marine itself to go walking. If you came down Barrington's Avenue today off the Black Rock Road, down to the end of the Atlantic Pond, you kind of turn a little bit right and then you go up onto the marina. Well, that's the pathway you're coming up today. And then to cross, in order to cross the track, you went over the spiral staircase, a lot of men dropped down on the other side. Uh, so that was the only people from Black Rock and Barrington's Avenue access to the marina because it was cut off when the railway line uh, went in. I love this photograph taken in uh, 1904. First train to go to Cross uh, stopped. They made a few months scheduled stops. Uh, this one was around by Drake's Pool. And you can see that there Lording up for the for the photographer, I love the women's dresses, typical Edwardian uh, period dresses. And you know, I don't know if he had a little tattoo, does he have the sports here? He seems to be enjoying it. Um, but the trains cross in as it ran right up to the end of the line for the, the railway company from Park to Point, which was 1932. And again, like the trams, it fell victim to the to use of buses or. Uh, People began to use the buses more frequently for the short uh, runs than, than they had prior to that. Uh, and it's funny actually, when the trans closed in 1931, I came across a reference in, in the newspaper actually, and it said that there had been 8 million journeys taken on the trams in Cork the year that they closed. 8 million journeys. But people using them all the time, going, coming and going to work and that. Now, if 8 million journeys wasn't enough to keep the trams going in a particular year, I don't know what would have kept them going. You know, so. But it just goes to show that they were heavily used, but still the buses took over. And that, that was progress back then, I suppose. This is another railway station that we have in the city. In fact, this is the oldest <coughs> existing railway station or railway terminus building that, that survives in the city today. And it's next to City Hall, the site of Eglinton Street, uh, which would be over kind of this side here. Uh, today the, the Elysian Tower would be behind it. Um, and this, as it says there, was the Cork Bandon and South Coast Railway Station. Originally the Cork and Bandon 
really their company was what they were known as because the, that was the run went from Cork to Bandon. In fact, the line was built from Bandon into the city originally. Um, and trains stopped running on that line in 1849, but they were only going as far as Bandon Hassan at that stage from Bandon to Bandon Hassan. Took about 20 minutes to get from Bandon to Bandon Hassan, and then you had to disembark the train and get a big omnibus carriage that brought you into the coach house of the Imperial Hotel in the back of the Imperial or the coach yard of the Imperial Hotel, which is where you got off or got on and off, depending on which direction you were heading. So it took about an hour to get by omnibus from Bandanax to get the car, but then only 20 minutes for the journey from Bandanax to Bandanax. So that was the way it was for about a year or so until they completed the line and into, into the city. Um, and they had that final in 1851, and the station was completed the following year in 1852. So, uh, since 1852, it's been standing here, as I said, it's the oldest one that we still have uh, today in Cork. The Great Southern Western Railway had a, a station that opened in 1854 on Penrose Quayside. That was replaced in, in the 1890s by the present day uh, Kent station. Uh, even though the trains were running earlier than that from Dublin into Blackpool, that was the stop. And then you had to get a coach in the rest of the way. But this one has been there since 1852. Now the Cork and Bandon then took over in 1880. A couple of other uh, railway companies. One was the Kinsale Junction Railway, and the other one was the West Cork Railway. And after that they changed their name to Cork. And, and South Coast Railway, they had lines running to many locations around uh, West Cork, um, including the likes of Tonic Empty and Skibbereen, Dunman Way, Cormac Shelley, uh, Timothy, uh, Bantry, all the way as far as Baltimore, the trains were running. And because of that, they didn't fall victim to the buses in the way that the shorter services did, like the trams and the Cork, Black Rock and Passage Railway, and they need the Cork and Musgrave Railway line out where the Jory's Hotel was built afterwards. So those short runs fell victim to the buses. This, the trains here remained in operation right up to 1961. Some of you might have even travelled on those trains um, right through the 50s. Um, and it was really probably the, the, the coming of the car, so the car becoming more popular and being more available to people that probably killed off the, the trains here more than the use of the buses because it was going much longer distance than the than the other ones. These are again just give me two views of what the, the yard looked like. This was in behind that railway station. These are been taken from the old footbridge that went over um, along by High Barney Road, is it? Yeah, yeah over the footbridge here going into Rock Savage. So <coughs> the top one shows the, the station more or less in its head here. When there was trains and carriages all over the place, you know, the main train, the centre there was going out of the big, uh, the big signal cabin, which was demolished I think in '67, um, and you see this fairly bare then in, in the, the lower images of the train to be seen, and the cabin is even demolished at that stage. So it just uh, goes to show that there was a very busy line. In fact, if you think of where it's located. You were the Cork Black Rock and Passage Railway, almost side by side with the Cork Bandon and South Coast Railway. And the Cork Matroom Railway was also using this station for a lot of their life, even though they were in Catwell, where the Catwell bus depot is there now. Uh, that was their home for the mid period of the Cork Matroom Railway life, but then they were back into the Albert Street again after that. Uh, and then you were the Fort Railway Company using it, which is the Cork City Railways. And the Cork City Railways were running right up to 1976. They were more uh, kind of a, a goods trains that were taking goods from the ships off the South Jetties and bringing them over to the trains in Kent Station to be shipped off up the country. And that's why both Clancarth and Brian Baru bridges were constructed specifically for that railway company um, which began trains began running in January of nineteen twelve. 
and they ran right up, as I said, from 1976, I think September 1976, they finished. There's a short section of the track here, just at the entrance to Cairns Tools um, of uh, Albert Keith, and that's part of the old line of the, of the old track of the Cork City Rail. But there used to be a little section of it going in that little, oh, that the curve there, just off opposite Brian Brew Street, just off that heading down towards Kent Station as well. Uh, that only disappeared in the, in the 80s as well. That piece is still there, and hopefully it will remain. You might remember that there used to be a guy standing walking in front of the train with the flags. The war oncoming traffic or pedestrians at the train, as if it wasn't big enough. <laughs> and again, in the South Parish, still we have our City Hall. Um, the original City Hall here, well it didn't start off life as a city hall or a municipal building, it started off its life as the corn exchange. It was built to replace the corn market on corn market street, which would be where the, the corn store restaurant is today, of the old corn market building. So in the 1830s they built a new corn exchange down here uh, on the quayside, and this is the, the building in this photograph. This is, uh, late 19th or early 20th century photograph because of the trams. Um, but in 1891, the city authorities took it over and turned it into the city's municipal buildings where the business of the city would be run from. Uh, of course, we lost, we lost a lot of our records then, city records and civic records in 1920 in the burning of Cork when the old city hall, as we call it, uh, was destroyed. Prior to that, we lost them, a big charge of them in 1891. Um, at the time that the, the new city hall was coming into use, they were just about to move from the courthouse in Washington Street. But there was a huge fire there just before they moved, and again, we lost a lot of records in that fire. So those two fires really have, have kind of left big gaps in our civic history uh, here in the city, which is why records, the records we have here, don't compare to a lot of cities uh, and the counties and towns around the country because of those two specific uh, fires. But it took about 16 years to rebuild the city hall after the burning of Cork and when this building was destroyed. And these, this, these two were taken during the building works. This is the view inside the hall, and our short is looking towards the river, or kind of south boards, to be honest with you. Um, but it's, it's the construction work of the new city hall taking place. And this photograph is taken from the tower of the old model school, the native district courthouse. Uh, and it shows a kind of half-built city hall, um, scaffolding up, and then you have the old wall and entrance gates to which building? Anybody? Carnegie Library. Carnegie Library, exactly. The library would have stood at the Anglesey Street side, kind of, it would be kind of down here, if you were to extend this shot, so it would be kind of located here. So these, these were the entrance gates to Carnegie Library, which stood there, but they are still in place. Uh, right up until the opening, of, or just before the opening of the City Hall, when they, when they took them down the new City Hall in 1936. In fact, they took the capping stones from those pillars at, say, Laurel and Carnegie, and you can still see them today in Cork. Anybody know where they are? No, don't no. Here, it? Huh? The library, the library. Yeah. Street, or just off Toppy Street. There's a, there's a staff car park to do for the city library. Staff car park, not a, not a public car park. Uh, up on up, up, Toppy Street, it's up just behind Ziggy's Bear. Oh, Ziggy's Bear is up here, Street. And at the back of that, if you walk around Toppy Street, there's kind of more or less space in the side entrance to Bishop Lucy Pair. There's a staff car park there, and there's two pillars, but I'm Kind of top the pillars of the old capping stones, 
from Carnegie Library, that same law in Carnegie, the beautiful old uh, writing. You know, so have a look at them the next time you're passing, but that's where they came from, uh, the old gates here going into the Carnegie Library. And what we're left with, of course, is this beautiful old, it's probably one of the, it must be, I'd say, the last proper stone building to be built here in Cork in the 1930s. I don't know, is there anything as good as that built afterwards? Incidentally, the, the, there's a distinction made at that time between a city hall and a municipal building. A city hall was just a big space, a big open space where events and meetings could take place. The municipal building then was where all the offices all day, kind of, the work of running the city took place. So this was the municipal building and then the hall was behind it. The hall was only built in 1906, the old city hall. Added on to the municipal building, if you follow me, so it was only in existence for 14 years, in effect, when it was borrowed in 1920. Back in the kind of heart of the South Parish, really, then you have this old church building, St. Nicholas's Church, um, just off Cove Street, behind the old demolished tax office there, and you get a good view of it now from, from Sullivan's Quay because the tax office uh, is gone. And that church, as it looks today, was, was built at the time of the famine, between 1847 and 1850. Although the, the tower and the spire were added until around 1869, I think. Um, but it, it was the last in a series of churches on that site. In fact, the, the original site was um, thought to be the, the court of one of the last Osman or Viking mayors of Cork. A man called Gilbert, uh, who was killed in the battle of the Normans in the 12th century. And after the Normans came to Cork and uh, took over the city, the, there was monks from Benedictine Friary in Exeter introduced into the church on, the, on his court. Uh, and that friary in Exeter was called St. Nicholas's Friary. So the church became known as St. Nicholas's from that time in the 12th century, and the name has stayed with it throughout the, the centuries, and the various churches that stood on the site. It's no longer used as a church, it was again, it was the Church of Ireland, um, of course, up the end of the Reformation, it would have been Catholic, um, but it's now used as uh, probation offices, as the city's probation offices. So if you're going there today, you're not going into a big open space of a church, you know, went into a kind of a, a warren of corridors and three different floors, so all the rooms off and so it's totally enclosed. The only thing about it is everything that they built within the church isn't attached to the walls of the church. So in 50 or 100 years, if they ever wanted to remove the wall interior, they could do it without damaging the actual fabric of the church itself, uh, which is a good thing, though know, they did refurbish all the old stained glass windows. Uh, again, that's a very good thing because they were in fairly shabby condition. Um, particularly the main one on this side here and the eastern side and the ones on the southern side which were very exposed. Were very, uh, very bad condition before they, they were put back together again and they were refitted and they looked magnificent. I would have grown up literally in the shadow of that uh, trust. I spent 50 years of my life in that shadow. Basically, so I, I lived just kind of down here and I walked around the park. I walked looking up that window for 34 years. To be honest. <laughs> and I listened to the bells on the Sunday morning. Uh, the bells were the storage, I think, now down the marine, at least they were up to recent years. Went down with you, this is a church in 1997. Uh, I was going to ask service, it was held there then and it was decommissioned after that. And uh, have you ever been to Bunratty Four Pair? Yeah. Yeah. Do you know there's a church in Bunratty Four Pair? It's an old church that was taken from uh, or Tipperary, the village called Ar Crony Tipperary. It was taken down brick by a block by block and then it was put back up together as part of the Four Pair. But um, that was done around the mid 90s and they were looking for church furniture to kit it out. So 
So it's probably the same thickness as church, which is just closed. And so if you're going to put 94 Park into that church, the, all the pews, the baptismal font, and the pulpit came from St. Nicholas's Church. So there's a little park up at 194 Park still today, uh, even though there's only a display in church as such, which is a magnificent uh, building. Inside it, and this is the view we have taken inside it, the one on the left, given to me by uh, Councillor Karen McCarthy, one of our great local historians. Um, and he took that out of the church had closed, but before this piece of sculpture was removed. And it can be seen today over in the Crawford Art Gallery, in the sculpture room over there. And uh, it's known as the Tracton Monument. It's a huge piece of marble. It's, I think it's the only piece we have in Ireland by a famous English 18th century sculptor called John Bacon. And with that, it's unique. There aren't any other piece by the here in this country as far as I'm aware. Um, but it was removed from St. Nicholas Church in the year 2000, as I said. It had been kind of shifted around despite its size and its weight on a number of occasions because it was to commemorate the life of the Baron of Tracton, hence the name of the man, the man called James Dennis, who died in the uh, 1780, I think. Maybe a little bit earlier. And he was buried up the old St. Mary's Cathedral, when we saw that black and white image of uh, earlier in the talk. And his widow commissioned this by this well known English sculptor who created it in 1788. And she went to the authorities in St. Mary's Cathedral and said, Look, I have this beautiful piece of sculpture by this great English uh, sculptor, John Bacon. I'd like to donate it to St. Mary's Cathedral. To mark the fact that my husband is buried here. They said we'd be delighted to take him over and charge him for it. They were going to charge her to take the sculpture. <laughs> so she called him over and said, No, thank you. And she brought it down to St. Nicholas's Church instead of the old previous St. Nicholas's Church. Then, when there was work being done there in the 1820s, they removed it from there and then brought it up to St. Mary's Cathedral. They took it at that stage. But it was the old cathedral still at that stage that they brought it in. So when that cathedral now had been demolished in 1865, it had to be moved again. It was brought back down to St. Nicholas's Church, the present day church, where that photograph shows it sitting. And of course, when that was decommissioned as a church then, it was moved again in the year 2000 over to uh, the Crawford Art Gallery, where you can see it today. It's a beautiful piece of work, well, and have a look at it. Uh, well, what the admission price and all of that with this vehicle. You know what I mean? I'll just finish up with a couple. The Red Abbey, our oldest piece um, <coughs> of architecture that we have here in Cork today. It's um, a 14th century tower that was added to an earlier Augustinian abbey that stood on the site. Uh, this is a few taken in the 19, late 1920s, I think. Uh, or possibly around 1930, but you can see the way the houses are literally built abutting up to the tower itself. You can see the way the roofs, it's like a big chimney coming out of the roofs of the, of the houses. It's a remarkable image. And if you went around the front, there was a, a roof coming on the same way out from the front as well. So there was, it was surrounded on four sides like that by houses. Um, the Abbey was used as by the Augustinians up until the time of the Reformation. And then they lost possession of it, came back to it for a while, but they were gone by the 1640s um, when it was in the hands of the Protestant Dean of Cork, a man called Michael Boyle. And he became the Protestant Bishop in 1660 and used the Red Abbey as his uh, official residence, his Bishop's Palace. So it went from being a Catholic Abbey to the Protestant Bishop's Palace, just for a few years. Um, during the Siege of Cork, John Churchill, Sir John Churchill would have stood at the top of the tower and he would have conducted cannon fire from uh, a battery of cannon that was in the gardens of the Abbey. They were firing on the city wall, roughly around where the city library is today. And that's where the breach in the wall was made and the siege 
was broken from there, so it was from cannon fired from the Red Abbey Gardens, uh, conducted by John Churchill, who had been uh, an ancestor of William Churchill, uh, who made or who broke the siege of Cork from this location. For much of the 17th century, it was used as a sugar refinery. That and the, the buildings around it, let's say, there was a lot of ancillary buildings, so there was a lot more to it than just a tower. And at the end of that century, 1799, there was a huge fire broke out, and much of the buildings were destroyed. Went out of use after that, it was taken out in a piecemeal then over the years. It was still in private hands right up to 1950, yeah, 1950 or 51 when it was handed over to the city council and has been in public hands ever since. Um, the houses there were stood until 1965. This image shows them being demolished that particular year. You can see you can go the digger and he's taken out loads of rubble. So that's a big open, that's the place. It's the same view in this one as in this one, basically, where all the houses are. Longer. And this is an image of the South Chapel. Can you see it? Anybody see the South Chapel there? You can physically see the South Chapel. Think about when it was built. 1766, the penal era. When the South Chapel was built, it was built at the end of a lane. That street didn't go over onto Douglas Street that day. Roughly where the car is, uh, <coughs> there was a wall and car was behind it, so the lane ended there. So the South Chapel was built at the end of a lane, set back from the road. So this was the main entrance, if you wanted to go into the South Chapel, from George's Quay. But anybody passing there, looking up, couldn't see a chapel. That was the idea behind it. Because it was a Catholic church built during penal times. So still today we look up and you won't see the South Chapel. If we get up closer, you'll see it, no problem, of course. Uh, but this map on, on the right here is a map from 1780. So you have George's Key up here, or Randall's Key, as it was known back then. Coming up New Chapel Lane, and then you can see where it ends, right at the gable of where the chapel was built, which is L shaped at the time. Um, so that street, it didn't carry on over at the Douglas Street for a number of years after that. So it was about 20 or 30 years situated right at the end of the lane before the street was opened up. That's a fantastic map, very detailed, mm -hmm. that you can see on the City Archives website. Um, we'll work to look at it just to read the different uh, bits of information on it. The chapel is still there, it's our oldest Catholic church in the city, it's still there since 1766. Altered a little bit over the years because, as you can see, the original church was L shaped. Then the southern transept was added in 1809. In 1866, the sanctuary was uh, extended by about 30 feet. So it is today, it is cruise form or crucifix shape. Uh, Daniel O'Connor would have spoken a number of big emancipation meetings there in the lead up to Catholic emancipation. Um, and it's the whole of one of the great pieces of sculpture work again that we have uh, in the city today. The dead Christ, carved by uh, probably Ireland's greatest 19th century sculptor, a man called John Hogan, who actually grew up just a few minutes from the South Chapel on Cove Street. And the top image there is Hogan's dead Christ. It's the altarpiece of the South Chapel that was created in 1832. If you go up to Dublin and you're walking along. Grafton Street, you see a sign for Clarendon Street Church. It's a Carmelite church just off Grafton Street. You go in the back entrance to it, and one of the first things you see is this. Hogan's first version of his dead Christ in 1829. So if you're in Dublin doing a bit of shopping over Christmas, have a look inside of that Carmelite church. 
uh, just off Captain Street, as I say. Um, and then you need to go further afield to find his third version of the dead Christ. You would have to go to Newfoundland, to St. John's Basilica over there. So that was created in 1854, shortly before he died. Um, so there are three versions of Holy Day Christ. There's also a plaster version which you can see in the Court of Bath family. So there's four versions of it that exist today. Um, but it will keep me any longer. I've gone a little bit over. Um, I hope you found it worthwhile having a listen and having a walk through this whole parish. One thing I just bring to your attention, if you don't mind, the mini, it's just to say that Jean is our chairperson of the South Parish Historical Society. Um, and recently we developed a website which is now up and running. So if anybody is interested, they can view it uh, at South Parish Historical Society.ie. There's lots of information on the parish, about the buildings, some of them that we've seen here, some of the people associated with the parish of historical significance, but also many, many old images of the parish in our photo gallery. So if you're from the South Parish or just interested, have a look at that website. It's it's well worth it. It's brilliant. It's brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> and thanks again, guys. Thanks for having me on.